Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with your co-host, the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice, and his wife, Jeannie. Michael and Jeannie share with you the wisdom of the ancient Aramaic internal process of forgiveness. They offer tools and support five days a week from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They will support you in building a solid foundation within yourself to live in pure love. In Aramaic, Rachma, Michael is the author of Why Is This Happening to Me Again? For more information on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.whyagain.com. And now your co-host, the forgiveness doctor, Dr. Michael and Jeannie Rice. And the truth that is rooted within. Hi, and welcome to Mind Shifters Radio with the Forgiveness Doctor, Dr. Michael Rice. Our call in number is 646 200 4169. We'd love to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments, if you've been doing worksheets, give us an update. And today is day 116 of our Memorial Day celebration. Hello, Michael. Hi, sweetie. How are you? Good. Wonderful. Do we have Dr. Tim with us today? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Is David there by chance? No. Okay. Well, then, let's start out with um, a little bit of an explanation of the idea of um, the request to honor Memorial Day. That is that what we're working to do, individually and collectively, is to remove hostility and fear from the minds on the planet. How are we going to do that? Well, you start with yourself. I love what uh, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. So we're working to be the change that we want to see in the world, and that change is to that of living a true human life. What is a true human life? A true human life is a life where you live in your newborn state. If you, if you think about holding a newborn child, you know exactly what human life is, and we live in a culture that's just about eliminated human life. And so I request of you to honor Memorial Day to those who have uh, died and been forced to kill in war, uh, been injured, maimed, brought those injuries home, and all the people they've affected. We invite you to, uh, to hold the space, first of all, of love for them. The number of suicides in active military is enormous. The number of suicides in former military is even more enormous. And we, we want to bring healing to this whole scenario. Why do we have war on planet Earth? Well, the answer is simple. You and I have hostility and fear that we're not willing to deal with. When we have hostility or fear that we're not willing to deal with, we dissociate from it, and we find somebody to blame it on. And the definition of blaming it on someone else is war. That's the beginning I would offer of war. The ultimate extreme, of course, is taking a gun to try to get rid of the them that you think is the problem in your life. And so we're inviting you to to forgive, and and that doesn't mean forgive them. Nothing to do. If you choose to pardon somebody, that's a nice thing to do, but it's got nothing to do with forgiveness. What we're talking about is the actual act of going inside yourself and removing the root of your hostility and fear. And so we're here to uh, support that process. If you're not familiar with the forgiveness tool, please go to our website, www.whyagain.com. On the right-hand side, you'll see a link that says Download Worksheets, five or six links down. Click on that. The first four links will give you the whole story of exactly how to go inside yourself and literally remove the very capacity for any form of hostility or fear, no matter what's going on in your life. So that's what we're here to support you in. That's what's going to eradicate war from planet Earth. We're in the middle of a a nine-day intuitive development intensive. Everybody's having a blast. Things are moving over. We'll be heading to Florida uh, in uh, late October to to take our work there and to uh, 
to uh, tour Florida. So if you're in Florida and you want us to appear, please find a venue for us, support us, help us to get a space. We pay our own expenses. The workshops are free. We'd be delighted to appear in whatever town you're in. And, of course, the number of workshops that we do when we do a tour stop somewhere depends on how many people we have that want to play. The larger the group, the longer the time we'll stay and the more workshop titles we'll do. So we invite you to join us in, uh, in Florida for some of those workshops. The schedule's on our website. And also we'll, uh, we'll be uh, moving throughout. Uh, actually, I think we start on the west coast of Florida, and then we'll be moving throughout south Florida and heading in that direction. So we'd be delighted to hear from you. If you have any calls or I mean, if you have any questions, we'd be delighted if you'd call in. Our calling is 646 we want to invite you once again, if you haven't been on the show the last couple of days, we're, uh, we're all here at Heartland joined in holding a space for David Hayes. Uh, David uh, got, woke up two mornings ago to a phone call uh, from his daughter-in-law and his 37-year-old son had died. His second son lost in uh, just a little over two years. It was two years and a week ago that his his 40-year-old son just fell over from a heart attack. and So, David, if you are listening or anybody in your family is listening, we are certainly extending our hearts and our love and our caring for you and holding you in that space of love from a distance. We know that uh, the active presence of love knows no distance, so we're just right there holding your heart, your mind, your body, your emotions in that space of connected love in our hearts. So we bring you into our circle, caring. And we also send light and love to your son, Ryan, on his journey, that he is freed of anything that would block him going straight to the light and straight into the arms of love and being in that space safely. So we're here to support you in that. Jimmy, do we have any questions in the chat room or any callers that have a question for us? No, not yet. All is quiet on the home front, is it? Yep, cool. Okay. Well, then, let's delve into some ideas from the why is this happening to the end work. And, and, you know, we looked at how many belief systems are on the planet about how life is going to be rescued from the insanity. And there are lots of theories and lots of stories about that, lots of doctrines, lots of dogmas. And in this work, we're not too interested in your theories, uh, your doctrines, or your dogmas. What we're interested in is supporting you in having a personal experience, personally experienced. Human life as I said earlier, is the active presence of love. Just hold a newborn. You know exactly what you are designed to live as. Because we have cultural and family systems that are a little insane, that are a little off the mark, uh, we find ourselves sometimes in difficulty in being able to live as that active presence of love. If you have difficulty in that, it's because stored in your structure are realities of some form of hostility or fear that inhibit you from living as the active presence of love that you are. And so the whole idea of the forgiveness process in every tool we teach is to collapse the parts of your mind and emotions that hold that which is less than love, whether it's in a, a relationship situation with a spouse or a child or a parent or a neighbor or, or a, a coworker or wh- whoever. If your physiology is producing some form of hostility or fear, you probably live in a culture that says, they made me. They made me angry. They made me sad. They made me afraid. But we'll invite you to notice that every time you've been angry, sad, or afraid, whatever, you're the only one who's been there. It's about you. It's not about your spouse. It's not about your children. It's not about your parents. It's not about the guy across the It's not about the guy across the world. It's about you. Forgiveness is how you go in and collapse that, how you remove what never belonged from a human system. So we're looking to, uh, to produce a direct experience of the active presence of love, and that is done by collapsing 
the root of hostility and fear, which is what the forgiveness process does. Did you have a thought for us, Jeannie? No. Oh, okay. Just heard a sound there. It sounded like maybe you're trying to speak. Okay. So to have that direct experience of love, the first order of business is to collapse that part of you that holds any form of hostility or fear. And what usually happens when you start to collapse that is you get, sometimes it's not but a fraction of a second before that, that old trained mind comes in and fills in the blanks with its old hostilities and fears. But over time, as you more regularly collapse the, the out of the hostility and fear-based mind, the mind that tells you that somebody else is the problem in your life, then you'll, you'll have a more deeply rooted direct experience of the active presence of your human life. And what we're looking to do is to support every mind, heart, and being on the planet, recapturing that by forgiving, by removing what never belonged. Now, we've been sold this bill of goods that forgiveness is about letting somebody else off the hook for what's happening inside of you. And I'd offer that that's a ploy to keep you from ever changing what's happening inside of you because as long as there's hostility or fear in you, you don't function at your highest and best. You're not at your most intelligent intelligent level. And the tendency is to be pretty controllable. So we support you in having that direct personal experience, personally experienced, and then trusting that experience as what will guide you to the truth. So there's a, there's a scientist uh, who, uh, who gave us a, uh, a really powerful way, different than the so-called scientific method, and that was that personal knowledge, intellectual passion, faith and trust were all elements that have led science to produce true knowledge about the world. And I'd offer exactly the same thing is what will produce true knowledge about yourself. And so we're looking to support you in having that true knowledge. We talked the other day about Michael Pagliani, an MD who was a cutting-edge medical researcher, chemical engineer, and um, his his take on science was, was that that... Uh, that we needed to have that personal knowledge, that personal experience. He, he introduced some some new dynamics to the scientific world. And when you have that direct experience, you will bring uh, a, a new awareness and a new knowledge into a world that's purposely structured and set up to prevent that new knowledge from arriving. You know, you, you, you look at the, word, the ancient word heretic, and it sounds like, gee, well, it sounds like something really terrible to be a heretic. Well, actually, what it means is a person with choice. The whole idea of dogma was set up in order to prevent one from having choice, in order to prevent one from trusting their direct personal experience of the active presence of love and functioning out of that love. And so when you recognize that that's been... Uh, suppress because it doesn't fit into previ- previously accepted uh, worldviews, then we have to establish a new worldview within ourselves and trust that. And you can trust that. You know, if you listen to the man named Yeshua, he says, I and the Father are one, and he says, the things I do, you too can do. And so when you come into that direct experience, you have to start to let go of some of the beliefs of the world. Some of the dogmas, whether it's science or theology, doesn't matter. A dogma that doesn't lead to you having a direct physical experience of the active presence of love in your physiology is not true dogma. It it just isn't accurate. It's a story that keeps us locked into a hostility and fear game, and look at how much of that is, is purported or just pushed throughout the world that hostility and fear game, even in in the realm of so-called spirituality. And it's time for us to move to that direct experience and establish new assumptions within ourselves. And, and that doesn't mean you, you jump all over everything that you think you know, but you start allowing yourself to have this direct experience as you forgive, as you 
collapse the hostility and fear based mind. Now it's going to rear back up. It's going to jump up so fast uh, with its dogma, and its doctrine, and its fear based. You know, boy, if you do this, you're really in trouble. Well, excuse me. If you allow yourself to have the direct experience of love, a human life, and you function out of it, you're not in trouble. You're on the right path. You're heading toward that space where you live as you were designed to live. And so new paradigms begin to replace the old. And though some worldviews are useful within the context of the way life is lived today, if you look at the results that it's producing, it's pretty bizarre and it's pretty insane. I mean, how many people do we have starving in our world today? Thousands starve, especially children, every day in a world where there's more food than everybody in the world could possibly eat. And because they don't have little green pieces of paper, the people who own or hold that food dump it into the oceans instead of feeding children that are starving. I mean, uh, let's face it, there are some useful things going on in our world. How many people today are going to die of heart disease? How many people today are going to die of heart attacks? Interestingly enough, the human is the only person, the only creature on the planet that dies by the clock. First heart attack, statistically significant number happened at 9 o'clock on Monday morning. Why? Because it's a point where we sell out our direct lives and our direct experience for a paycheck, for money. And so if you look at the game that we've played, while it's produced some awesome benefits, 200 million people have been murdered in war over the human history and in the last 100 years. You look at the direction the worldview has been going, technology, technology, technology. Einstein said it's time for our emotional growth to catch up with our intellectual growth and our technological growth. When we allow that emotional growth to take place, we're going to find that we function best as human beings connected to love out of the space that we were designed to function out of. And we're here to support you in the process. Jeannie, any questions in the chat room or any callers? Nobody has their hand up. Um, there was one person that says, oh, I didn't know I was logging into the chat room. I just clicked on a link in an email about an interview happening on Sunday um, with Evan Slauson. I work with for him. But hello, I can't hear anything, so I will dial in to see what's being discussed. So, Judy, if you're able to get in, a lot of times uh, what happens uh, in the chat room is uh, up above where it shows the name of everybody that's in the chat room, there's a little speaker, and so you need to click it, make sure that it's on, because sometimes it's automatically turned off as a default. You may have to refresh your window. The chat room acts kind of funny sometimes, so uh, give that a try. But if you're on the phone and you're listening and you have a question, anybody that's on the phone listening, if you want to talk, please press 1. That will let me know that you want to speak to Michael. And otherwise, our call-in number is 646-200-4169. Cool. Well, there's a uh, philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer. He uh, lived back in the early late 1700s to the mid-1800s. He was a German philosopher. And he made a very astute observation about truth. And that is that it goes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And finally, it's accepted as self-evident. Well, when you bring a new paradigm into the world, when you start... and, and the new paradigms that need to come in are really the oldest paradigms around. They've just been, they were violently opposed when they came in. You know, you look at the paradigm of, I give you a new law, love those who hate you, do good to those who despitefully use you. That's a new paradigm. It came in 2,000 years ago, and it was ridiculed by the power mongers of the day, both control over people's lives, didn't like that idea, because how do you get people to make war if they believe that stuff? Of course, it's not much different today, is it? People who will say they believe in what the man said and taught, but they don't live that way, and, and oftentimes it's difficult to live up to the level. So, you look at 
thought was ridiculed, and then, because it started to gain hold, it was violently opposed. And it hasn't become self-evident yet that that's a powerful place to live. What does it mean to love those who hate you, to do good to those who despitefully use you? Well, it's really pretty simple. When you realize what human life is, all it means is that you live your human life, whatever somebody else is doing. You live in, and again, define human life, the active presence of love. Hold a newborn, and you know what human life is. So love those who hate you. It's got nothing to do with what you do to that person. It's got nothing to do with your behavior toward that person, although your behavior toward that person will change. That will be an effect of living that rule, that new paradigm. At 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 the point 2,000 years ago when that idea was put forward, the game was kill people that you don't agree with, people who don't do good to you, kill them. And, of course, many people still live by that paradigm, while proclaiming that they don't, that they believe in the man who said, love those who hate you, do good to those. So what does it mean to do that? Basically, it means that you will recapture, in the presence of what the world might call your worst enemy, the active presence of your human life, the active presence of love. So now you'd be fulfilling the part that says, love those who hate you. Sometimes the most challenging ones to do that with, as he said 2,000 years ago, will be the members of your own family. Why? Because they have access to parts of you that take you out of love. And it's only the things inside of you that you hold that are unforgiven that can take you out of love. So the first part of it, you'll live in the presence of your human life. You will hold to that newborn state no matter what happens. So love those who hate you. Do good to those. Now, think about a behavior in the presence of another person. Imagine we've just delivered a newborn from the womb. And imagine that newborn, out of its state, could do a behavior toward your worst enemy. What do you suppose that newborn's behavior would be? You know what it would be? It would be the second part of that command. Do good to those who despitefully use you. That being does that automatically. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense when you think of the world out there being the problem. But once you realize that the world out there is not the problem, the world in here is the problem, the world in between your ears, the world in your chest, the world in your gut, the world in your pelvis, that's where the problem is. I want you to recognize that, then when you offer good to those who you think have been taught to think of as the enemy, then what will happen is you will put that energy called good into the part of your tissue structure where you have a problem and you'll begin to move to a new level of wholeness and a new level of healing. That's what it means to be to do good to those who despitefully use you. And so when you function out of that newborn state, when every time you go to do a behavior, you think of, oh, okay, so here I am a newborn. What would my behavior be here? Oh, it would be to presence love. It would to be to behave out of love rather than all the things that my culture and my bloodline have taught me. Now I get to move to a new level of healing. This is a new paradigm on planet Earth. It was introduced 2,000 years ago. It still hasn't been lived. Hasn't been lived. Who are those people that would say, when when he says, "Love those who hate you, do good to those who despitefully use you"? They'd be the people who have a different belief system than we. They'd be the people who seem to be, as the world calls them, our enemy. You know, we hear people saying, "Bless America," and instead of, "Why don't we bless the whole world?" Well, Michael, there are people over there to be afraid of and enemies. Well, yeah, okay, Creator. I understand that you've created it that way. And, you know, whether it's the enemy that sits across the table from you when you're having dinner, that you call your spouse or your child or your parent, or it's the enemy from the other side of the world that you think because they have a different way of thinking, a different philosophy. But let's listen for a minute. Let's see if we can actually grasp hold of a new paradigm. Einstein says, If you think you are separate or separated from the rest of humanity, you're living in an optical delusion. Thomas Bone, who 
if we had not had McCarthy attacking and going after Bohm and driving him out of the country, we'd probably mention his name as a physicist and a neuro researcher before we mentioned Einstein. Thomas Bohm says that we live in a mind of sustained incoherence, that our hostility and fear separates us, and that once we tell the mind that something out there is separate from us, there's somebody out there that we can blame who's the problem in our lives, and if we can just fix them or attack them, then everything inside of us will be okay. What Bohm says is, that's a picture created out of the beliefs and the thoughts that you hold. It's not true. Again, Einstein, it's an optical delusion to think you're separate or separated from the person sitting across the table from you or the person across the world from you. You are all cells in one organism. Basically, one cell that attacks another cell is called a cancer cell. When we give up attack and we function out of our newborn state, how did that go? Love those who hate you. Function as the active presence of love and do what the newborn would do what will happen is you will pass an empowering, soothing, healing energy through every cell in your structure, and you'll begin to heal all those parts of you that have been taught that there's an enemy out there, that there's a problem out there, and that all you have to do is get rid of them in order to feel better. So by following that new paradigm, and you know we can, we can look at a deeper level on that, when you look at the idea of law from the ancient Aramaic, the word law has nothing whatsoever to do with the rule of a superior as you know the kings would like us to believe. The word law is a, a word that describes how our understanding of how the eternal forces work. There's no superior involved. There's no punisher involved. And so you look at this man named Yeshua 2,000 years ago, and he offers us a new paradigm. He says, first law is when you think of the creator, when you think of neighbor, you function as a human being. You love. New paradigm that hasn't been caught on to yet. We think it's fair and reasonable to hate the person who, you know, we're getting ready to pick up a gun and shoot. The person we're ready to go to war with. The the person we're ready to spend billions of dollars to find weapons with which to kill them. And we're killing cells in our own body. Now, when you recognize that this mind that we humans have is totally and completely programmable, then you realize that all of these beliefs about separation and hostility and fear are all simply based in belief. And because we're creators, in our creatorship, we create the world that we believe. And then produce the evidence and only are able to see the evidence that proves that it's true. There's a really awesome film on this point. If you uh, it, it's one of those that is an idea to buy and own in your library so that you can watch it off and share it with others. It's called Joyous Noel. French title. Joyous Noel means happy or Merry Christmas. And it's a true story about a battle happening in France on Christmas Eve in 19, I believe it was 1918. And a German soldier uh, was on the battlefield in the trenches, and he had been an opera singer. And so as an opera singer, being Christmas Eve and being so-called Christian, just like the people on the side of the battlefield were called Christian, killing each other, he sang out the song, Silent Night. As he sang this song, the British and Australian, American, French soldiers listened to the beauty of his voice and started to respond in kind. And soon, according to the story, and there was a man who just who didn't participate in this but just sat back and made notes, according to the story... The, all of these voices start singing out Silent Night and before long these soldiers who minutes ago were killing each other are on the battlefield together 
sharing pictures of home, their children, their families. Recognizing the oneness that they each shared. They play football and they start to realize, and there's a, there's a very powerful song, it's on our website. Uh, let's see, what's the name of the song? Christmas in the Trenches. And this beautiful baritone voice sings this song. Tap into it on the website, it's awesome. One of the concluding lines in the song is, we realized on the battlefield that day that on each end of the rifle we're the same. And those who make up this whole game of war aren't the ones who go to war. They stay safely in their ivory towers. So these men, who hours before were shooting and killing each other, progressively move through calling a truce. They give themselves, they they decide between themselves that they will call a truce long enough for them to to take the dead off the battlefield and bury them. And then as they're doing this and communicating more and more, they more and more realize their connectedness and their oneness and their sameness. And there's a priest there from Scotland. This is a true story, by the way. And this priest says Mass because they're all basically Christian Catholics, whether they're the, the Scots or the the, the uh, Brits, there are Catholics among them. This priest is a Scottish Catholic. There are, of course, other denominations from the British countries, the French, primarily Roman Catholic, the Germans, many Catholics among them. He says Mass. And his chair in a celebration and once again realizing the depth of their oneness, come to the point where they realize they can't kill each other anymore. They can't live out of the paradigm and the belief system that this person who's the same as I, who has children they love, who has a spouse at home that they love, who has parents they love, they can't buy anymore the paradigm that this person deserves to die. Of course, we live in a culture that with words puts the person who is supposed to be the enemy into a place in our minds where it makes it okay to treat them as the enemy. You know, you look at the words that are used in each conflict, and there's always a derogatory term for the enemy, whether it's crowds or nips or japs or, you know, whatever it is, derogatory terms, in order to force somebody to put this person in a lower place in their mind where they can justify killing. Well, here they are on the battle, and they can't do it anymore, so they're forced to go back to their trenches, and they fire over each other's heads. Again, one of the lines in the song that's very powerful is the soldier asks the question, whose family do I have in my sights now that I know this man is the same as I? And I forget whether it's the uh, the Allies or the Germans that uh, get the message that they've, they're about to bomb the trenches on the opposing side, the leader comes over and says, hey, we're getting ready to bomb you. Get over here. So everybody from, and I say, I don't, I don't remember what's the for the Allied trenches, everyone goes to the opposite side and we'll bomb the trenches. And then when the bombing's over, they go back, and as they're going back, they say, well, you know, we're going to do a retaliation. There's going to be bombing of yours, so why don't you guys come over with us? And so here they are switching sides back and forth. When the uh, those who promote and um, brainwash us into war hear about this, they're outraged. There's a Roman prelate. I don't I don't remember if he's a bishop or whatever he was, but he shows up on the scene and defrocks the priest for daring to say a mass for that included not only his own people but the enemy. You know, this tribal thinking that everybody who thinks and behaves the way we do is acceptable is something that needs to go in order for us to realize the truth of who we are. So this Roman prelate 
just dresses down this priest, defrocks him for daring to do such a thing to celebrate Mass on Christmas Eve. And then you hear him in the background giving a lecture to the new recruits because they can't force those who have had this experience of their oneness to kill anymore and they remove them from the battlefield. It doesn't say much about what happened to the soldiers on the Allied side, except you hear this bishop, he was, dressing them down and telling them how right and how holy and how it is their obligation to kill this terrible enemy. Then the Kaiser shows up on the German side once again to dress down these men who won't kill each other anymore. And they fairly graphically speak of how this whole crew who has realized that war and murder is murdering oneself is sent to the front lines of Russia to be killed where they know they're going to die. Can't dare have somebody who knows the truth. Can't dare have somebody who lives in a new paradigm. Can't dare have somebody who knows what their human lives are and lives out of them. Our invitation to you today is to start to put an end to war in your life, interpersonally and internationally. What's the hostility? What's the fear that you hold that it's time to let go of? Is it a hostility or fear toward yourself? Toward another, toward a member of a certain class of people? You know, maybe if you're a female and you've been abused, it's a it's a a, a hatred or a, a resentment toward men. If you're a male and you've been abused, maybe it's a hatred or resentment toward women. What is it that has you feel what you feel that takes away your human life? If you don't know how to forgive, please, please, please go to our website, www.whyagain.com. On the right-hand side, there's a set of instructions for how to remove all of that insanity from your physiology, your genetics, and from your bloodline. It's called forgiveness. It'll seem a little strange at first because it's not the classic Greek idea of letting somebody else off the hook for what's happening inside of us, it's a totally new paradigm. And it shows you precisely and exactly how to collapse the insane beliefs that you've been fed based in hostility or fear. And having removed those beliefs, how to go into the direct experience of your human life, the direct experience of the active presence of love. So that's what we're here. That's what we're here to do and support you in. That's what we're all about in this work of why is this happening to me again and Mind Shifter Radio. There are support groups springing up all over the country. We have at least three of them in Chicago after our recent visit there. Dr. Tim has one up in Crystal Lake that he's been running for about six years. Absolute awesome happenings in that group every week that he he gets on with me. It's, it's just another set of miracles happening and another set of lives that have moved from the insane, hostile, fearful lives. I mean, people who, you know, when I was with Dr. Tim, hello, Michael. Um, Michael just disappeared. Let me go back and tell him. Can you get him? Well, this is Dr. Tim, and uh, we had somebody from our group call in yesterday and share some of the uh, struggles they're having and some of the successes they're having using the tools and the Responsibility Communication Worksheet. And Michael helped uh, clarify the process quite a bit. And um, in the chat room today, we have Nene talking about the Responsibility Communication Worksheet and her comment was that she saw the responsibility communication video for the fifth time this summer and realized that we spend so much time trying to convince the other person of our point of view and then she revisited the first 20 minutes of the tape and it became clear to her that it's so important to be aware of our own internal dynamic when we hear something that triggers our and she says MC, so I don't quite know what that means, but um, our messy communication, 
our projected communication. So she says, so I'm always in a relationship with myself no matter what goes on in the outer world. That's absolutely right. My mind can only show me what I tell it to show me. And if I am not actively working to crack through to my unconscious, to lift that veil and ask for help in getting access to it, I will be driven by reflexive activity. Oh, Nene clarifies that she meant the cellular memory. <laughs> yes, the cellular memory from the carbon-based memory just gets triggered and it produces my response unless I'm completely aware and taking full ownership for everything that arises within my thought and my emotion. And she's talking about why the common tendency when we talk to somebody is to immediately interrupt them and tell them what to do, etc. Well, that's going to happen every time I think I know I'm right. And as Michael commonly points out, any time I'm in any kind of hostility or fear, it doesn't matter what my mind is telling me about how I'm right. I know I'm wrong. And I can only hope that I'm wrong, because if I'm right and I'm in pain, there's no outlet. There's no no solution. But if I'm wrong and I'm in pain, well, that's great, because then I can change. So, Jeannie, are you back? I'm back with you, Tim. Thanks for jumping in there. I appreciate your support. Uh, well, here we are out in the boonies in the Ozarks, and sometimes the phones just aren't 100%. Cell phones are, are fun to work with. But I'm back. Can you hear me all right? Yep, I can yeah. hear you now. Awesome. So I was just starting to share uh, one of the stories that you told me about a person who was uh, who had started at the support group that uh, could hardly speak up and was in depression and, and great layers and levels of pain when he first came to his first support group. And the shift that had happened for him, uh, it's it, it, just awesome to watch. This, this man came to most of the workshops when we were there and was alive and vital and communicative and playful and, and just uh, awesome, awesome young man. So it, it, it's just fabulous to see the results that are happening. And I haven't heard from Carrie in a day or two, but I'm going to say... Uh, Another support group that's meeting in Cary, Illinois, not far from where Tim is, one of the places that we spoke when we were there. And uh, there's a support group meeting in Naperville, Illinois. Heard from a fellow named Rex Montague Bauer the other day, and he's in Lansing, Michigan, just did a Y support group or a Y a workshop last Sunday. He's been doing the work for about 20 years and started up a support group. I don't think we've got the information yet on that to get it on the website, but if you uh, are in the Lansing, Michigan area and want to know about that, it's a note to Jeannie and we'll get the contact information so you can find out exactly what that support group is doing, where it's needed, timing. And I have a... Hey. I have a... Um a Why Again workshop scheduled for uh, Sunday, October 16th at the Unity in Crystal Lake. Awesome. So I'll end up doing the uh, doing the sermon at the service and then doing a workshop in the afternoon following the service. I hope you're going to record that. I, I would will, love to hear it. I'll do my best. Awesome. That's fabulous. Well, congratulations. I'm excited and delighted for us and for the world that you're doing that and taking things to a new level. There's a young lady that was uh, at Heartland this uh, this summer and did teacher's training. She's in um, Miami, and she started a project, and I'm just, my brain isn't wrapping around the name of the project, but... Um, it's a project where she's offering support uh, to people in doing worksheets. And she's agreed to do personally one-on-one -on -one over the phone or in uh, over Skype to do uh, worksheets with folks. And, and what she's doing is she's starting out and giving them away free, five free sessions of, uh, of worksheet support 
and then she sort of designed a little, a, a kind of a cool uh, little setup, and that is that she's uh, giving people these five sessions, and after the first session, asking for the commitment. There, it's kind of like their payment is that they will commit to doing one worksheet a day. And then after their second session, she asks them to up that commitment to two worksheets a day. And then after her third session, she's asking them to up their commitment to five worksheets a day. And she's been forwarding to me some, uh, some emails from people who, uh, who have been doing that process. And she's just been getting awesome results right off the bat with, with totally new folks who don't know anything about the work but are jumping in and starting to do worksheets with her on, uh, on the phone and, uh, and on the uh, Internet. So, so it's pretty cool happening. Congratulations, Bayou. And Bayou's, um, see, I, if you're interested in contacting her, uh, you could drop Jeannie a note in the, uh, in the chat room. I don't know whether her schedule is full with the people that she's, uh, she's giving sessions to at this point. Uh, it's, she's calling it Project Momentum. And so with Project Momentum, she's inviting people to move forward and take the work. So she's taking a, a different approach, having gone through teacher's training, and it's, uh, I think, going to be an awesome contribution that she's making. I know she said she's working with about, I think, 10 or so different people at this point. And so she's, uh, she's really doing some creative stuff with, with the work, and it's awesome to watch. She's also invited anyone who's become proficient at the worksheets to communicate with her. She's got, it looks like, people uh, coming online than she can handle. So she's inviting and anybody else to, to, uh, to do that. I think what she's doing after the fifth worksheet is that if people uh, wish to do more than the five worksheets personally with her on the phone, then what she's doing is um, is going by the um, progression, it's called phi ratio, of the Nautilus shell, and she's into mass numbers. So she's charging for the sixth worksheet. If people want to do it with her personally, she's willing to continue to do that. And she's charging $11 for the first session. I think the second session is 11 and the third session is something like 16 and then 30 you know, So she's, she's doing this kind of progressive thing so that people can really tap into the power of the worksheet. And Michael, you're gone again. Yes, he is. You got challenge. <laughs> Well, um, that's a delightful thing that uh, Deyu is doing, and I can attest to the fact that she's um, very talented. She's done a lot of different work, her own work and energy work before, so anybody who gets in on that deal is is um, getting quite a value. Um, I should also mention while I'm here that uh, there's a, a documentary about the horrors of the cancer industry that's out, and it's available for view on the internet for free, I believe it's going to be through the 24th. And if you go to Vimeo.com and uh, search for the movie Cut, Poison, Burn, Cut, Poison, Burn, which is basically the only thing our cancer and our medical community does to treat cancer these days. They either cut it out, yeah. poison us with chemo, or they burn us with radiation. And... Um, it's a very powerful documentary about that process, and it's available to watch free on the Internet. I put the link in the chat room, or you can go to Vimeo.com, V-I-M-E-O.com, and search for Cut, Poison, Burn. So, Michael, are you back? I am. This is crazy phone. What can I say? I'll have to do a worksheet. Yep, do a worksheet. And probably have some worksheets with you if you go to watch the movie Cut, Poison, Burn, because it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have watched about two-thirds of it. It is pretty awesome. And, of course, our 
invitation is that with those who are playing that game, that we hold that space of love and healing. That, you know, every human being, nine, what have we got, nine or seven and a half billion people on the planet right now, is the cell in our own bodies. And what we need to do is extend our human lives, our being to them. One of the other, I'm just looking at an email that um, Deu uh, sent, and she's encouraging people that she's been working with, work with the commitment, and she created a list uh, and, you know, suggest to people that you can read it to, to, to these folks either silently or out loud as you prefer. And then she's got a list and she first puts yourself first and foremost. Second, both your parents, family members, spouses, children, exes. I prefer to call exes formers. Stepchildren, in-laws, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, extended family members. Anyone you need to resolve a conflict with the near and dear ones who've passed, bosses, colleagues, associates, and others in your workplace, doctors, dentists, health practitioners, psychologists, therapists, teachers, anyone you and your children work or play with, groups you connect to, you can read it in your heart to the whole group, groups of people you've dissociated from, maybe you've judged them or see something wrong with them, politicians and the people running countries and cities, etc., economists, financial career people, people you hate or dislike for some reason, people in the road with you as you drive, or people on the road, pardon me, people at airports, people in shopping malls and airplanes, people in collective areas where you happen to be standing or sitting. She's just suggesting reading this. Think of all the people you'll connect with and deal with today. Put them in a group in your mind and repeat the commitment to them. And that's a, that's a, a really cool idea. Dale, again, I acknowledge you for uh, for how creatively you're putting this work out to people and supporting and inviting uh, that active presence of love to become uh, more widely uh, expressed in our world. It's uh, a fabulous uh, game that you're uh, you're setting up and moving forward. And we appreciate your support. We appreciate the creative thought you've put into it. And there's a there's an interesting story that um, Jeannie has. This actually happened to her. Maybe you'd share it, Jeannie, with the, about that gentleman who uh, told you about his relationship falling apart back several months ago and then his follow-up phone call to you as he followed your suggestion that he start uh, using the commitment with the woman that he was thinking about divorcing. Do you care to share that? Yeah, he was, um, well, you've told the first part. Um, and so he called and he was like, You know, we're back in relationship. Everything's going great. He said, I'm reading the commitment to her every morning. He said, it's just made such a difference. And I asked him, I was like, well, is she reading it back to you or are you just reading it to her? And he kind of stuttered and looked at me and he goes, she doesn't know I'm doing this. He was doing it in the bathroom, reading it to her. And so even though she wasn't participating in the commitment, it was totally changing their relationship because it was changing him. It's all energy, and as we move in the space of that energy, we start to open new spaces for human life to show up. What an awesome thing. What if the person you call enemy today, you were the one, you know, there's a great principle expressed in The Course in Miracles that says what you see in another, you enforce both in them and in yourself. What if today you were the one who said the words of the commitment and held the space of being projected toward them that helped them to shift out of something painful in their lives and move into that space of connectedness and human life. What an awesome gift to give somebody. If you have a family member in pain, what an awesome gift to offer that commitment. And you can go to the the website, www.whyagain.com and you can download the commitment free. Uh, it's uh, it's on the website in many different languages, uh, English, German, oh, I don't even know all the languages. But it's there in lots of languages. And you can download it. There's a, there's a specific commitment that is to do with yourself in the first person. 
uh, there's a copy of um, of a one to do with the person who you have a relationship with. And so there are lots of uh, lots of different copies of it on the website. And as you tap into that, then you move to a new level. The commitment that Jeannie and I used in our wedding vows, we titled, of course, Our Commitment. Let me share it with you. And let me share it with you, Jeannie, uh, here over the, uh, over the airwaves. I promise to trust you enough to tell you the truth and treat you lovingly, gently, and with respect. I will do this in my thoughts, words, and actions, whether in your presence or not. In every interaction, I will look for and acknowledge the highest and best in you as I surrender to love, our true nature. My relationship with our Heavenly Father and nurturing my relationship with you and our children are always more important than any issue. If anything unlike love comes up, I will hold this in my heart and learn, listen as I learn to speak, experience, and be responsible for my own realities. I'm here for and with you. I will keep communication open and keep love conscious, active, and present as we play, pray, heal, and celebrate life together. Thank you. Jeannie, I yeah. reinforce that commitment to you. And in the most awesome ways, appreciate you being in my world and in my life. So do we have anyone in the chat room uh, with any questions or thoughts? Do we have any uh, any callers? Is everybody just being silent today? Everybody's just being silent. Okay. We have yeah. about three minutes. Oh, we just had a hand come up. Awesome. Let's go for it. I was just going to ask Tim if he had any experiences with the commitment to share, but let's uh, uh, go to our caller first, and if we've got time, we can ask him that question. Aries had 541. Hello, 541. Welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good show. Thank you. Catherine. A beautiful one. Yes. (laughs) Um, Is it possible to let us know how to reach Deu? Yeah, if you just put a, uh, I don't have her permission to put her out into the, the website, but if you want to just, if you're in the chat room, if you leave um, Jeannie uh, an email mm-hmm. or address, uh, we'll pass it on to Deu and invite her to be in touch with you. I guess I better get an email. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not in the chat room, then email me at Jeannie at yagain.com. That's J-E-A-N-I-E at Y. WHYagain.com. And I have your um, I have your phone number stored in my phone, and so I will yeah. uh, I will pass that on to Dayu and ask her if she'll call you. Oh, great! Thank you. And then, awesome. if, if your if your vow isn't too private, is there any way to reproduce that on your site? Say say it again. I couldn't quite hear you. The promise that you made to Jeannie is that if it's not too private. Could you put that on your site? It's very on the website. It's on there. I believe so. That one's on the website. Oh, it's yeah. already on there. Okay. Yeah. You can you. just go there Thank and you. download it and, you know, start to use it with yourself in the mirror. There is a first person. You know, I promise to trust myself enough to tell myself the truth. My own neighbor. Yeah. And speak the truth. And so tap into the website. You can do that from the library if you don't have a computer, www.whyagain.com. In the far upper okay. right-hand corner, there's a link to an awesome web uh, show that we did with a sample worksheet where we walk a woman through the worksheet. It's fabulous. Our show is complete, so I'm going to have to just sign off. Thanks for your call. Thank you. And we hold this space for the best year yet of your eternal life. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Mind Shifters Radio with the forgiveness doctor, Dr. Michael Rice and his wife, Jeannie, who present the internal Aramaic process of forgiveness. 
Michael and Jeannie are here every Monday through Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Earth Angels Radio. For more on Michael and Jeannie, please visit www.yagain.com. That's www.whyagain.com. Continuously. 